All right, just getting things set up. We're going to go live in about three minutes. So if you're you know catching this on replay, um, just start this at about three minutes into the video. Good morning, Brent. And if you can let me know if you can hear me and see me, that'd be great as I get all this stuff set up. And I'm just setting up the chat. And can we just do a check if you guys, okay, great. Thank you, Sharon. There's a little bit of delay because I'm using some software, but if you guys can see me and hear me, that's wonderful. So we're gonna get started today with um, Garden Grounds. This is my public live q and I usually talk about a subject or two very, very briefly, but we'll take all your questions. And again, this is public, this is for everybody. A couple hundred people at peak will show up in here, so it can kind of be difficult for me to answer the questions. This used to be 30 minutes. We're going to do this for a good 45 minutes, maybe an hour. I do this every second Thursday and fourth Thursday at 11 a.m. Eastern time. And it's just a way to sort of have, you know, a garden mentor to help you with your questions. Um, but also people in the chat can help each other out. Maybe you guys can connect with people that are local to you. That's the best way to get, you know, support with your vegetable gardening and stuff like that. So this is again is every second and fourth Thursday, 11 a.m. We'll go for about 45 minutes. We're gonna wait just about another 30 seconds for more people to sign in. I see people are showing up. And if you like this format, if you'd like to be able to answer or ask questions, um, I have a perk membership. And the perk membership is all done through YouTube. You go to my YouTube channel, you find the join button, and you pay a monthly fee. It's a small fee. And I do four, at least four, mentoring Q&As a month. And they go for a good 60 minutes. And there's only about 10 to 20, maybe 30 people on them at a time. I also do two live classrooms just like this and teach a subject related to gardening and those are all part of perk memberships and if that is something you want to do you also have a chance to send in videos to me um, video questions and i put them together in a series called grow as we grow made up of a tour of my garden but really tour of the perk members gardens and again you can find that in the video description so if you are going to Ask a question, please just in bold, put question so that I can pick it out from the chat. Now, the, today's topic is going to be direct seeding a fall garden. The best or the, well, probably the best, but the least expensive way to have a garden is to direct seed. In a pack of seeds, you get so many seeds, you know, you can't plant them all usually in a year. They're actually good for a good three to five, even seven years if you put them in a Ziploc bag or some sort of sealed container. And it costs pennies to grow all kinds of vegetables by direct seeding. So we'll be talking about that. Does anybody have any questions to get started? Please go ahead and toss them out there. And I just gotta check one thing and you know, I'll get back to answering questions here. Hang on. I'm just reading and it looks like the weather is just again all over the place. Uh, my wife's from uh, Michigan so we've been up there many times and that's pretty high temperature wise and with the humidity. Any questions to start? If not I'm going to just roll into direct seeding. All right just oh question can't find local seeds uh, so local seeds, 
You mean seeds that are grown locally? Because that is really, really hard to find. Um, sometimes there's a theory that if you're buying seeds that are grown in your general area, they are more, you know, online, wherever you get them, and then start collecting seeds yourself. And you can watch varieties that seem to do well, or if you're growing several varieties of the same tomato plant, sometimes one plant seems to do better, save seeds from there. But it is hard to find local seeds. The best way to address that, uh, Heather, is to maybe look in Facebook groups or other places that there's seed exchange groups going on and see what you can find. Derek, what's the Captain Jack's powder recommended for squash bugs? So what I recommend for squash bugs is an insect dust that has spinosad in it. S-P-I-N-O-S-A-D, spinosad. Captain Jack's uses that ingredient, but the ingredient you're looking for, it can be by any other name, but it's spinosad. It's organic treatment. It will kill crawling insects and beetles. However, the squash bug, I just wanted to make sure I got that right. The squash bug is, seems to be really resistant to insect dust. So spinosad does work when the squash bugs are juveniles and just hatched, but when you're bigger and mature, they're pretty, they're pretty tough. But you're looking for Captain Jack's dead bug dust, and it contains spinosad. Um, question, is there still time to get another round of sunflowers blooming before frost? So I, if your frost is like October 31st, I think you have time. Um, check the back of the packs for you know ones that may bloom sooner, but we're gonna cover this in a second. Well, let me just cover it now to answer your question. So when you're planting a fall garden, we're gonna be planting some warm crops that are gonna mature more quickly and get you food in the fall. And we're gonna really be focusing on the cool weather crops. Cool weather crops can take a frost. They like the cold weather. They can go well past the frost date, but your warm crops can't, like sunflowers. But because the soil is so warm, it's like 90, 100 degrees, the seeds really germinate quickly and because it's warm, they grow really fast. And because they're growing really fast, they mature more quickly. So yes, in my opinion, you do still have time to get sunflowers into the ground. They're gonna accelerate, water them well, and you can still get blooms. Some of the warm crops that you can plant now, I'm in Maryland Zone 7, my frost date is around October 31st. You can put in cucumbers, squash, zucchini, bush beans. They're gonna germinate in little as three days. Yeah, even shorter day cantaloupes and melons that may be mature in 65 days, although it's getting tight for them. They're gonna germinate quickly, they're gonna grow quickly, and again, like I was saying, keep them watered. In the hot wa weather, water is the key to successful direct seeding. You really have to stay up on that. And you probably have to water, if not every day, at least every other day. Because if the hot sun comes out, one day, no clouds, hitting the sun, it's gonna raise that soil temperature easily to 90, if not 100 or over 100 degrees. And that top inch or two is gonna dry out really quickly. A little tiny seedling can be killed off by the heat. So yes, seeds germinate quickly, plants grow more quickly summer to fall, but you really have to manage the water and protect them from the high sun. So some of you may not be able to do what I'm talking about till later September, because you're in a hotter area. And maybe if you're up north, maybe you wanted to start it a week ago. But I'm always gonna encourage you to start seeding now, take notes. All right, I gotta go back up, find some questions here. Julie, um, if seeds last this long, is it okay to buy seeds? at the seed sales in the fall. Yes, we're, so I have a seed shop, therustedgarden.com. You can find all that in the video description. We put stuff on sale and just because, and they have to be stamped, you know, what season they were prepared for. But just because they're prepared for 2023, put them in a Ziploc bag in a container, save yourself a ton of money, and they're gonna be viable for a good three, five, seven years. Now like lettuce seeds dry out more quickly. Every seed has a kernel of water. So sometimes they're tougher, but you get like a thousand lettuce seeds in a packet. So just put three in a hole or something when you're planting. But seeds last for a long time. You can even put them in a refrigerator and they'll, they'll last longer. So a great way, don't be fooled into thinking you have to throw away seeds that are stamped 2023 and buy stamps for 2024.
Oh, okay, Heather. So, um, well, I have a seed shop. I mean, we if you order the seeds from me, the rustedgarden.com, we send them out within 48 hours uh, and you get them pretty quickly. And a lot of people grow with them. They're great seeds. If you ever have a problem, you just email us and we replace them or we work out something that makes you happy. Christina, how could I go about starting a plot for a fall crop? Start with a grassy area. So it is possible now. It all depends on the resources, and there's just so many ways that you can do it. One, um, you can grow in fabric pots. They're an inexpensive way to get stuff going. If you want to build a plot, you can just lay a layer or two of cardboard down over the grass, and then you can build a frame around it like eight inches, fill it with soil, you can plant most of your cool weather crops in there. They're just going to grow in that top four, six, eight inches anyway. They have more shallow roots. All your leafy greens, um, etc. Peas will do fine. That cardboard decays really quickly, kills off the grass. The roots will go through it because it's moist, go into the ground, and that's just a quick way to get set up. I have lots of videos on um, setting up beds using cardboard. You cannot build a frame. You can just put down the square of cardboard that you want and put in six or eight inches of compost or a mix of compost and topsoil, whatever you have. And that just kind of gets the planting area ready. What you would use, because maybe it's not fertilized the best way, just any water soluble fertilizer like fish emulsion. Um, water soluble means the plants get the nutrients right away and that would get you started. Come next spring, you're going to have a great space for gardening and you can kind of get started that way. That's a big question. So that's the short version. Nina, when is the best time to harvest my tomatoes? Should I do it early? Uh, no, I let them ripen until they turn full color. And that might be, you know, if it's a green tomato, it turns green, yellow, yellow, orange, orange, red, red. But when you kind of press a green tomato, the one that's not ripe yet, it doesn't budge. As soon as it turns the color it's supposed to be and you can see a finger depression go into it, it's ready to pick. You could pick them a little early if you want. If you have pressure of maybe squirrels eating them or something like that, you can certainly let them ripen on a windowsill. But I just let them ripen on the vine. And, you know, as you get maybe closer to a frost or freeze, maybe you take some of them off. Although green tomatoes are wonderful to harvest late September, early October, and just slice them up, bread them, and, you know, lightly fry them. Susan, can saved flower seeds be planted in the fall? They can, but if they're annual seeds, they're going to sprout. They might make it to flowering before the frost comes. So you do have time. Cone flower, so zinnias are annuals, and annuals get killed off by the frost. The cone flower, if it germinates, gets established, sets roots, it will die off, but it's going to come back, at least in Maryland it does, and similar zones, because it can take a freeze, a frost, and it comes back year after year. So it depends on your strategy. Um, but the answer is yes. Saved flower seeds can be planted. Now, some flower seeds need a period of freeze or cold or stratification is what it's called. So like, for instance, a cone flower flowers, produces seed, drops it, it knows it's dropping seed usually into the fall and it wants to sprout and grow in the spring. So, and this is an example, it may not be exactly the cone flower, but you'll get the idea. So these seeds sit on the ground and they have a chemical in them that has to go through a very cold period. That chemical decays and then the seed is free to germinate. So, and this way that seed survives, doesn't germinate over the winter, gets all the cold that need, like the perennial flowers do. So you could plant zinnias, marigolds, etc. You don't have, Sally, you don't have to store your seeds in a sealed container. Usually the house is fine, um, but a sealed container, one, yes, you do need that. You just don't want air and humidity and stuff getting to it. 
The refrigerator can help them last longer. Like if you feel you're gonna be using these seeds, wanna be using them four or five years later, I would probably do it. Um, also depends on how much room you have, but you don't have to use a refrigerator. Brent, full sun seems to be questionable for me. I've found that some plants, warm season, tend to bake in the full sun. Some plants only six hours of direct sun. You find the same in your garden. Yes, so that's one of the biggest mysteries. Partial shade, partial sun, what does that mean? How many hours do plants need? Oh, eight hours, um, at least six. Like there's all this information out there, but you don't really know until you're planting in your garden and you're watching what's going on. For instance, ginger loves the warmth of summer but hates that baking sun. So it likes the warmth ambient temperature, but it likes cool soil temperature. So you have to find a place in a garden where it's probably getting six or eight hours of sun, but maybe it's not getting the direct sun at two in the afternoon. Maybe a tree shades it or something. And I do that with my blueberry bushes. I have the best ginger ever because it's getting what it needs. So sometimes you have to, you do have to move plants around. My eggplant, which plants love the heat surrounding temperature where my plants eggplant bake in the sun they don't do as well in my other garden where it's getting seven eight hours of sun and some protection they do better so you you can move them around and you don't have to be set like like tomatoes and peppers if they're only getting six hours they're going to be kind of wimpy and straggly they'll still produce but not great they definitely need eight hours eight plus hours ten hours is great but when the summer comes, they will shut down. So you need to use a shade cloth. So I do, to answer your question, yes, I find that in the garden. And you just kind of have to learn your different kind of microclimates or micro sun, I guess we could say, if it's in your garden. Scott, my garden is loaded with tiny white flying insects. Suggestion. So you want to try and identify them. It could be white flies. They could be under the leaves of your plants. And if you move it, you see this white, little tiny white speck flying around. You, know, you have to treat them, usually with uh, a soapy water spray that has oil in it, something that contacts them, the oil smothers them, messes them up, and you have to stay on it. But for any diseases or any kind of problem that comes into your garden, first of all, take notes somewhere of when they first showed up. And the best way to deal with pest and disease is by starting to spray and treat two, three weeks ahead of time. So next year, you're kind of managing the problem before it gets out of hand. But it's hard for me to answer that without seeing um, really what they are. All right, just trying to find it here. And again, if you want to answer a question, type in question. Um, I'm going to miss some of them. If you see that I missed it, go ahead and retype it. Um, but I can see already there's more questions here than I'm going to be able to answer. Hold on. And the feed goes so quickly, sometimes it's hard to find where I left off. That's why things get missed. All right. So one more question, then I'm going to go over a little bit about direct seeding. Uh, Gail, we are starting a meadow with flowering native perennial flowers. Should we do some direct seeding in the fall or wait until early spring? If you've got the seeds pretty uh, cheaply, and sometimes you can get bulk deals, I would prep the area or wherever you want them to go, put some down now, um, and then put some in kind of first of spring as it's beginning to warm. And that's usually the best strategy to get them established and growing. It's also not a bad idea sometimes to start, you know, just start them in containers or something like that and then plug in the plants throughout the garden. <clears throat> but the easiest way is to scatter the seeds about now and again in the spring. And maybe in saying that too, if your meadow is more annual but because they're natives it's making me think well you say it right there that they're perennial you can put some of them in now and if you only want to pick one time to do it i would do it in the spring in this way maybe you don't have to do extra work
All right, just trying to get caught up here. All right, so I think we're good for that. So direct seeding is the most inexpensive way to get your garden started. So you have your cool crops. First of all, you want to find when your first frost date is. In Maryland, it's the 31st. So the cukes, the zooks, the bush beans, they can go into the ground now. Because of the warmth, they're going to germinate really quickly. They're going to grow more quickly. They're going to mature sooner than it says on the back of the seed packet. Most of us get burned out. And we don't think of a fall garden as portion of it being warm weather crops. So those crops you can get in now and you can be harvesting from your fall garden. But your fall garden is mainly the cool weather crops. Lettuce, spinach, all the brassicas, broccoli, cabbage. Um, there's a lot of them. Spinach, arugula, uh, even carrots, beets, chard can take frosts. Um, and what you're doing is, is you're getting them, you're trying to figure out the best time to get them into the ground in August. If you're where it's really hot, like Texas, Florida, you can't really do this till late September, October. If you're up north, probably you can do it now, but maybe you want to do it more in July. You're trying to get the timing down so that your cool crops get the benefit of the warm soil, germinate quickly, get growing, but they're going to mature and finish out when temperatures drop into the Day temperatures drop into the 70s. Night temperatures are dropping into the 40s or 50s. You want the cool weather crops to finish out in the cold weather. If not, if you plant them too soon, and I've already done this, you know, making videos, like I put radishes in on, or I put in pak choy, bok choy, pak choy, um, August 4th, it got leggy. It's already looking like it's going to flower. It's not forming a nice loose cabbage head. So that was the wrong time. Pak choy, the Asian greens, can't really go out into my garden as seeds really until the beginning of September. So you have to experiment is my point. And you might want to put in some radishes August 1st, some radish seeds August 15th, some radish seeds, seeds September 1st. See which ones make it to maturity, nice, you know, radish. And then next year, because you're taking notes, you know when to get the radishes in. Same thing with the lettuces, etc. Um, or spinach. Like spinach doesn't want to sit in baking sun and germinate. It's just not going to happen. So you do want to test plant now. Don't look for the exact times for radishes, spinach, lettuce, broccoli, kale, etc. Kale and collards are another great cool weather crop. No source is going to be able to tell you when to exactly put them in the ground. You have to get used to um, experimenting so that you can see how they do in your sort of uh, not sort of, but in your garden, it has different kind of microclimates and, and stuff like that. Um, Derek says, I, this is not a question, but it's a good point to how I answered a question before. Um, he was uh, spraying neem oil and it was working. It's not, and I appreciate it that you got it from me and letting people know I sell it. It's not so much the product that you use because a lot of them are effective. It's really on the gardener to keep a routine in place. Spraying every seven days, 14 days. You don't have to spray the entire garden. You, you spray the crops that have the problems. And this routine is what reduces, yeah, this routine is what reduces down the damage from disease and pests. Sometimes you can eliminate them, that's hard, but you can really reduce the damage by sticking to a routine. So I see you guys are cutting lawns down. I have a new book, it's actually over my shoulder, Growing an Edible Landscape. It's all about reducing lawns, growing food, in a garden of course, but also on your whole property. And that's going to be, um, <laughs> why did I lost the thought? Yeah, it's going to be available in November, but it's available right now for pre-sale on Amazon or anywhere you buy, buy books. But growing an edible landscape is about really transforming your property into something edible, usually for us, but also pollinator gardens, flower gardens for bees and nature. And it's just reducing the lawn down. We need lawns for some things, but we usually don't need as much lawn as we have. Lawns don't feed anything. They just cost a lot of money in water. Um, you have to cut them. You have to pay for that. You have to fertilize them. And they're, they're just a money sink, really. Okay. If you have questions about direct seeding, let me know, too. 
So how to start a meadow on a hill of weeds. So it's really hard, you know. Um, yeah. This is Susan's question. Weeds are unwanted flowers. Weeds are usually native, usually. They know how to live, they know how to survive, and it's really hard to get rid of them unless you decide to spray chemical killer, kill out all the weeds. Still, there's gonna be seeds. But if you don't do that, you really just have to cut it down low. You can put down, if you want, clear plastic tarp, weight it down, usually right now, July, August, and you just let it sit over that space for at least four weeks. If the four weeks is more rain and stuff, you're gonna have to go to six weeks. But you want the sun going through the plastic, heating up the ground, killing everything there, and then you remove it, and then four, six, eight weeks later, you scatter your seeds in. And that's the best way to clear it without chemicals. If you use chemicals, you wanna just use something that kills the stuff, breaks down quickly, and is gone. And I know people don't like to do that. But those are your only real two choices. Your third choice is to cut it down you know, with a mower, um, maybe put cardboard down, four, six inches of topsoil on there, throw the, your seeds down, and you're still going to get pushed through of weeds and stuff. But those are the options, in my opinion, of how you would get started. You cannot save sherry. Can you save seeds from peppers that have been frozen once thawed? Well, my gut says no, but when your tomatoes drop to the ground, your peppers drop to the ground here in Maryland, they freeze solid, and I get peppers that survive. However, not all the seeds are going to survive. So, you know, there's so many pepper seeds in a pepper. Some of them stay viable. Some of them make it. Um, you could try, but if you're going to do that, I would be planting a lot of pepper seeds into a transplant cup or into the ground hoping that one of, them, one of them is viable. So Debbie, the wildflowers to grow. So I don't know if they're germinating and then dying off or what the issue is. All I can say is Summer's a tough time for the wildflowers because the drought and the sun can kill them off. So early spring, later fall is usually best. Um, and I would just, you know, think about the watering, but I would just need a little bit more information. Janet, I see your question. And again, if you guys are just signing on, um, put question in front so I can see it. Again, if you want to do a super chat, that pops up. I can answer that question right away. I will try and answer as many questions as I can in 45 to 60 minutes, but I know there's a lot of them going through. Good morning. Can you tell me how to naturally kill worms off my plants? I live in Jamaica. So naturally doesn't mean safe. It just means it's not a human-made chemical. And why do I say that? Because even your natural organic sprays and dusts and stuff kill good and bad insects. So it's possible to be killing bees while you're trying to kill worms. Depends on the worm, but if you have something that's eating and chewing the leaf and chewing holes into things, I recommend neem oil. And if you're gonna buy neem oil, um, I know you're in a different place, so I can't sell it to you because we don't, we don't ship. But if you buy neem oil, you wanna make sure you get 100% cold pressed neem oil with azadiractin in it. You want all the natural components and the azadiractin in neem oil kills off the chewing insect. You can also buy products that have BT in it. It's just abbreviated with a BT. That's organic and that's natural. Um, those are the things that I would start with. Stacy, I've harvested more worm castings. I was reading to add it to water and then wait 24 for hours. Why wait? Thanks, Gary. Good question. I have no idea why you would wait 24 hours. I mean, what's the difference? Um, maybe for it to dissolve or something like that, but you know, you're mixing with water, it's <laughs> being diluted by the water, just go ahead and, and pour it. I don't, I don't see the benefit to that. If you put castings and dried manures and other things in water and you wait, it begins to stink eventually. 
Uh, bad bacteria can get in there. It could be a problem. In 24 hours, I don't think it'll make much of a difference. But when people are making teas or they're, you know, creating something over three, four, five, six, seven days, you have to put an aerator in there to make sure oxygen is in there that supports the good bacteria. Uh, Christina, will spinosad dust kill the caterpillars from the white butterfly? Yeah, so that white butterfly lays uh, green cabbage worms. It should. Um, I've used it before. It does kill them off. It's good for that. All right. Questions. Tiny, what way can I automate my cool weather garden task? Do you have a video on drip tape or oleas? I'm on a I'm also interested in arthritis friendly tools when I gut when my um, when I go into my garden. So obviously you get a flare up, it's hard to do things. So I don't use drip tape, so I don't have anything on that. I mean that is a good way to do it. Um, and you just have to look for what works best in your space. What I do recommend is really researching the drip system, having a timer that goes between your faucet, spigot, and the drip lines and you want to make sure you have enough water pressure to reach out to the garden because the drip lines sometimes do really well in the front but as you get out to the end of the drip hose not a whole lot comes out but you just kind of have to experiment that way to kind of find what works um, arthritis friendly tools i don't really know i guess it depends on where your arthritis is but you know maybe bigger tools where you have to grip less or if it's in your back you know tools that are longer but I don't know um, but I hope you know your pain is minimal speaking as I get arthritis too it, it's just it's no fun <laughs> aging is no fun being alive is fun getting old can be tough um, that's why I love the garden I enjoy just focusing each day on the garden each year on the new season and just seeing what life brings Heather, I soak my bean seeds to plant, but is there a time frame best to plant them? I'm afraid they are soup now. And they could be soup. So that's a good point here to what I'm kind of talking about. So in the warmth, when you're planting into warm soil, you know, May, June, July, August, you really don't have to pre-soak. You do have to keep them moist. You want to make sure any transplants going into the ground, any seeds going into the ground, you're watering them every day or every other day because of the hot sun. That's enough water to take care of a bean plant, pea seed, etc. Um, they're going to germinate quickly. The reason that you might pre-soak earlier in May or in April with pea seeds or things when the ground is cool is because the seeds germinate more slowly and they sometimes get wet, they can sit in there, they can get molds, they can get beat up. So pre-soaking is great from going from cold soil into warm soil but once you're into warm soil if you want to pre-soak half a day put them in at night you know when you go to bed at nine o'clock get up next day sometimes after 9 a.m plant your seeds they don't have to be soaked for a long time because they will get fragile they can break apart you know maybe 12 hours but for the for the warm garden um in the summer you don't really have to pre-soak seeds Uh, let's see, got to find where we're at. Kathy, so birdies raise beds. Do I recommend them? No, because I'm affiliated with Vijega. So if you go to my video description, you can get they're the same metal beds. So the designs are the same. The colors are the same. There's like Vigo, Vijega, birdies. Birdies is a wonderful company. I respect them. Nothing wrong with buying them from, you know, buying your metal beds from them. Um, but I do recommend metal raised beds. Um, Vijega, you can use, you know, my link that's in the video description. They're wonderful. So if you have an opportunity for metal beds, I would do them. If you check out my videos, especially um, garden ramblings you, uh, and even my pepper videos, I have 
I think 12 bell peppers in a 32 inch Vijega metal bed. And they are the most amazing peppers I've grown over the last three years. Because in the metal beds or raised beds for that matter of fact, you can put in great soil, it stays moist. You can, you know, feed them as you wish. And it's just, you create this beautiful soil. So metal beds are wonderful to use. It can be expensive filling them. So if you wanna to go to my channel, search filling metal beds, filling raised beds, making your own potting mix, making your own container mix. I show you ways to save a lot of money by just kind of following the principles in those videos. But just to be clear, Birdies is a wonderful company. Those are great metal beds. All right, so every time I talk, the chat moves forward a bit here. There's probably a way to lock it, but I don't know how. <laughs> Neem oil, um, if it's cold pressed neem oil, Sherry, it will thicken. And what you do is you just get warm tap, tap water, put the bottle in there, it melts, and then you use it that way. But depending on the pressing time, um, you know, time of year when it's being pressed, most of it comes from India, it does thicken up, especially if you keep it in the house, the cooler temperatures, um, but just put it into warm water. So, Nina, what is the spraying tool you use for peppermint oil in your videos? Um, I'm guessing that's probably just the one gallon sprayer. I just use gallon spray. So I just use a gallon sprayer or two gallon sprayer right on it. Peppermint oil, right down the recipe, you know, the recipe that I talk about. And some soap, peppermint oil, gallon of water, and I just spray out of that. You don't need to spend a lot of money on a sprayer. You just want one that's you know, obviously not going to break, but the Home Depot brand is wonderful. Dorothy, good question. If ants aren't far farming aphids, are they beneficial in eating bad bug eggs? They might be. There's so many different varieties of ants. Like I have some ants, the real tiny specked black ones, will get into under the root systems of my plants and it will eat the roots. I have other ants that just run around and I don't know what they're eating. I have some ants that will steal seeds. I have a video um, when I was shooting, uh, I think my video for uh, direct seeding 35 crops for August and September and was doing something. And then I look over and the radish seed is just being, or the arugula seed is just being pulled away by this little ant. So it depends on the variety. Neem oil does stink. I'm one of the people that like the smell, very odd. Scott, my wife gets bit all the time. What is safe to use for mosquitoes? I am one lucky person in that, you know, I was just out in my garden. There's all kinds of mosquitoes. They leave me alone. Or if they do land on me, they're not biting me. Or I only get one or two bites. So I don't have an answer for you because I've never really looked for anything. I don't know if there's anything actually like safe that, you would spread throughout your garden to kill them off because they're gonna just fly in from different places. I mean, and they can just lay eggs in you know, a leaf that's holding water or small teaspoon of water somewhere in your garden. So they're really hard to manage. I wish I had a better answer. The shelf life of the neem oil I sell, that's a good question. I've never been able to find out exactly how long it lasts. If you're keeping it indoors, you know, it is at least good for one whole season, obviously, this year. It's good for a second season. I've used the same bottle, just a little bottle, over two years. Um, I would suspect it would be okay in the third season, but I've never gone really past two full seasons. I use it up, you know, before then. But there's no reason to think that it would decay. Now, if you have it out in your shed and it's getting hot and cold and hot and cold, that may impact the compounds in there. But keep it in your house and it's pretty stable. Oh, thank you for the belated birthday, August 21st. <laughs> I don't wear cologne unless you want to call it sweat and <laughs> um, compost and all that kind of stuff. 
Uh, all right, so let's see. What else I have on there? So other things to keep in mind. So when you're planting like radishes in the warm, cool weather crops, maybe in August, beginning of September, there's new pest pressures because so much stuff is active. Flea beetles, uh, ants like we were talking about, snails and slugs tend to be around more. So when I plant radishes in April, they're kind of, you know, really labor free. I don't have to do anything to them. I just plant them, I water them, they're fine. Nothing seems to bother them. Right now they're getting hit by flea beetles and chewing insects, so I have to lightly dust them. So there's gonna be a little bit of a shift with new pests and pest pressure on your cool weather crop. So if you're planting lettuces, very quickly a snail slug could come in and get them. Maybe birds are more active. So you just wanna keep that in mind. Like my romaine lettuce is doing wonderfully in a fabric pot under a tree. I'm gonna grow a bunch in there and then transplant it through the garden. But you do wanna keep in mind that there could be different pest pressures. And then the biggest thing just for the cool crops I wanna stress again is that you could plant them all August 1st. So warm, soil, ambient temperature, they grow, they grow fast, they flower quickly, they set seed, and you don't get anything good. So you're really trying to get the timing down to get the benefit of quick germination, some good growth, and then the cool weather rolls in. 70 degree days, 50 degree nights, 40 degree nights, and those temperatures really cool, and then those cool crops finish out in the cool weather, obviously. Like for instance, radishes, forming in the heat, get really spicy and woody and they're hard to eat. Radishes forming in the cool weather, cool soil, sweet, crisp, crunchy. Kale, collards, the leaf is less leathery, more tender, very sweet when that frost comes. And most of your cool weather crops can really take a lot of frost and they keep growing and they keep going. So I wanna just encourage you um, to really think about getting another round of those fast germinating growing warm crops and your cool crops and you could have to experiment with the time so that wraps up the fall gardening piece um, so let's get back to questions so and there's all that kind of stuff like i've just caught the so I'm O positive. So, um, you know, I'm sure that's not too much information, but I'm O positive in the sense that mosquitoes leave me alone. But some people with O blood, O positive, still get bit. So I don't know what the answer is. All right, got to find out where we are. Um, Nina, I forget where you live. You could try some broccoli indoors, um, but the crown itself, if it's forming and it gets a harsh frost, it kind of gets rubbery and beat up, but the leaves can take a frost. So I would, I always encourage people to try it. Write down the date get some started indoors and see how it goes. Maybe put some out in a garden, just a couple areas, a couple of seeds. Um, I know I just saw the containers that you're growing. Um, put it next to something that's smaller, see what it does. But sometimes you use this current year to kind of collect information so that you can plant next year and have more success. I just wanna encourage people to not feel like you have to know everything to plant, just start planting, start to learn. I'm still learning stuff. I've been doing this for, ooh, I don't know, at least 30 years. Um, I'm really experimenting on melons. I have melons growing everywhere. It's kind of chaotic, but I, I must have like 15 watermelons. I'm getting, you know, close to a dozen cantaloupe in different places, but I'm using this time to figure out where do I want to grow the melons next year? Which ones are working or which ones are growing best? Um, what kind of trellis is the best, and just kind of having fun with it. Mara, you can, I would direct seed carrots now. Keep them nice and moist, um, but they can, they can take a frost, so you have time. Collards, 
collards, cabbage, and a lot of the cool crops may not really grow at 26 degrees. They may, you know, slow down a little bit. So like, you know, you, you couldn't really go from something small to something big. But as they're maturing and they get to size, they stay alive. They're, they're, the kale, I have a kale that will winter over winter, gets a little beat up, and then come spring, it just takes off again. So when it gets cold, Maybe the plant's not destroyed, but it does stop growing in the sense that it, you know, gets bigger and keeps producing. So I am like 95% organic to answer Heather's question. So you have yellow jackets, you're allergic. Um, there's a nest somewhere. I would get a spray spray the nest, kill them off, you know, use it in a contained way, very focused. If you can't find a nest, you can get yellow jacket traps. I would put them up. They will attract yellow jackets. So don't put them like at your table that you're sitting at or by your tomato plants, put them on further out away from your garden where you're going to be. It will kill and reduce the population. Scott, when do you plant radishes? So realistically, Maryland zone seven, I can start planting now. I can plant beginning of September, middle of September. I can even plant August, I'm sorry, October 1st, maybe even towards the end of October. They can take a frost. Um, you know, you just don't want the deep freeze. So those are plants you can start now. And that's kind of why I was saying you want to test them out. So the ones that I put in early August got really chewed up by bugs. They're a little bit leggy. Um, we'll see how they do but there's a long period for radishes because they mature really in as little as, you know, 25 to 30 days. Seek, it's way too hot in Texas. So cabbage, I feel like in Texas, you don't wanna be getting your cabbage out really until the temperatures aren't getting past 90 degrees and they're starting to come down. I don't know when that is, but at 100 degrees, you know, baking the soil, it's a lot of work. Now, what you might do is if you have a space, you know, and you have the starts now, put some out, but get a 70% shade cloth over it. Just really shade them and that will really make a difference. But I don't think you can put them out directly into soil, in the sun and hope you know that they do something i'd either wait till later september for that or i would use the shade cloth now dorothy so lima beans I, I haven't had great success i don't grow them so often but that's happened to me too it sometimes depends on the variety you're growing but if you're growing them they're to size they're flowering you might want a different variety only I mean, it also can be the heat. Plants shut down in the heat. Like my beans stopped producing, got beat up in the end of July. I started watering them again. The temperatures are cooling here in Maryland. All this new green growth is coming. So sometimes it's temperature related too. But I would try and think about when you planted them, what the temperatures have been like. And, you know, it could be something along those lines. But I love the plain old green beans. I like purple potted green beans, I like cow peas, and I like yard, yard long beans. They all seem to do pretty well for me. Uh, Angela, can I transplant tiny kale charred seedlings into a five gallon bucket? You can, um, be their permanent home, or should I pot them up and wait till they are bigger? I mean, if they're really tiny, tiny, um, unless there's a rush to get them in there, I like to, for them to get to a good size and then you can put them where you want. But if you take care of them, there's no reason for that. It's possible that when they're tiny and small, if they get hit by a heat wave and you miss watering, that they do die off. Bigger plants are a little more durable. Uh, tiny, what's your opinion on no dig? I have a bed, no grass. Can I just put soil on top? make a border, you don't need to till. Um, 
So it's not really, in my opinion, no dig or dig. There's a lot in between because you can set up your no dig, your six or eight inches. When you go to plant a big transplant, you're going to dig with a hand shovel, loosen up that space, put them in there. You don't have to turn the soil to put seeds in or anything like that. So you're basically just creating a good four, six, eight inches of loose soil that can be directly planted into. So you can certainly do that. Um, and the garden will be fine. Plant roots will go into that harder soil um, with no problem. And then over time, you're adding more compost, more material onto it and worms and stuff are kind of mixing everything together aerating the compact stuff that's in the bottom and it just becomes a good place no dig means that you don't have to turn it all of it and you don't have to you know add in compost turn to compost the people are just putting the layers in planting right into that pole bean will get 10 12 14 feet and it keeps growing and growing Bush beans get to a set height, set flowers, produce, and then they sort of die back. No dumb questions. All right, where are we at? So we're at 1148. I think I will go till 60 minutes for um, this public uh, garden grounds Q&A. If you do like this format, you want to become a perk member, please check out my YouTube channel. The join button's there. It's all done through YouTube. And I communicate all the events, the schedule of events, through the community tab on my YouTube page. Um, Queen, I am not directly affiliated with hose link i do videos for them every once in a while i have hose link retractable hoses all over my garden i've had them up there now for probably four years i think they're one of the best out there so i would check out hose link i don't have um, a discount code or anything for them candace is talking about um i don't know what trophy radish is but getting idea of kind of what you're suggesting is, is you can get plants that have longer tap, root, tap roots that go into that harder soil and break it up for you. You just let them die off. They've created air space in there with the root. You know, life comes into there, breaks down whatever's left behind, and you start to loosen up your soil. Uh, Michael, when is the book available? Do you have a chapter about building homemade trellises for climbers? cucumbers, pole beans, roses, etc. So the book, Growing an Edible Landscape, I don't have a specific chapter in building trellises or anything like that. It comes out in November. It can be pre-ordered. And my first book, Modern Homestead Garden, that is available. It's been available for two years. And that's really focused on a homestead garden and all the components to grow in a vegetable garden. Thank you, Tiny. Um, growing an Edible Landscape is really... a little bit of a different book and it takes your perspective of just having a garden or having no garden and just lawn and that a garden goes over there lawn goes over there non-edible bushes go there and really looking at your property and transforming it into something edible you know for people and for nature um, so that's that book I don't have a third book plan but my third book would be be a continuation of the modern homestead garden and just about everything that I talk about about cool weather crops warm weather crops planting strategies and then the trellising designs would be in there bed designs would be in there so more would be in there but that book has yet to be written I am going to be doing a lot of ebooks so if you want to check out let me put this in here the rusted garden this is my my blog the rusted garden .blogspot.com. I'm writing in there now every week it's called the rusted garden journal there may be trellising videos and stuff in there um, I have a lot of trellising videos on my channel that you can visually see things I've talked about building stuff I have a video on taking deck railing you know the deck railing you buy putting some 
well, I can't think of the word, Lat not latches, hinges, hinges on them, and then they close up like this, you can store it, or you can just open it up into a triangle, and I have stuff growing up it. So I do have stuff on my channel. Um, I will be doing ebooks, and I'll be selling them in different ways in the future, but that's going to be 2024, and one of them could be on, you know, designing trellises for your garden. The best way to buy my book really is um, pre-ordering on Amazon is good because a publisher likes to see pre-orders. Um, and I, I, I appreciate that help. I mean, that's probably the easiest way. Um, what benefits me is that the book is well received. People are buying it. And then, you know, maybe I write another book. So it all works out pretty well. At some point, I may have them at my... Um, at my store, the Rusted Garden, uh, therustedgarden.com, and you can buy them that way. So the crib is a cool idea, Ruth. I think that's really cool. So you can, like I have a ladder that I bought for like five bucks, a wooden ladder at some um, yard sale, and that's used for a trellis too. Thank you, Julie. Very appreciated. And I'm excited about that book. It's, you know, it's going to give you what you need if you're a new gardener to get started growing vegetables, all the basic vegetables. Also talks about um, seed starting and all that. Doesn't go into it as, as in depth as the modern homestead garden, but it's really a shift. Uh, I mean, it's a nice history too. It's co-written with one of my friends of lawns, of how we kind of been brainwashed to just have lawn, lawn, lawn. We have HOAs that say, all you can have is lawn. Get rid of those tomatoes, they're ugly. You can't have compost in your yard. And they kind of make us have this sterile environment that doesn't do anything. So the edible landscape is really about that, creating an edible landscape. Yes, you need lawns if you have kids or you need, you know, you want a place to sit or whatever, but there's so much more than we that we can really do. All right, so good six minutes left. Um, Heather, do I need anything? Do I need to do anything to soil in a container? I pulled plants. Can I? Okay, so uh, welcome, Witchy. Thank you for joining. Um, I'm just thinking of your question. So you do need to do something to it. You don't need to dump it out. Container soil is good for two years, three years, and you, and then I dump it out. I put in some more compost, peat moss, fluff it back up, and I reuse it. So you never have to throw your soil away. But if you're going to plant a fall garden, maybe that's what you're talking about, you have to go and um, add in handful two of organic granular fertilizer, mix it through. If you have some compost, throw that in there, mix it through. You're basically just fluffing it up in a container, putting in the organic granular. Organic granular is a slow release fertilizer, which means soil biology has to break it down. There's not as much biology in containers, but that will slowly break down. And then you're just gonna use a water soluble fertilizer, fish emulsion. I recommend AgroThrive. You can find that in the video description. I am affiliated with them. It's immediately available to the plant. That's what the plant's gonna use in the container. The main thing for container soil is you want it to be loose, you want it to hold water, and you wanna be giving it fertilizer in some capacity. Organic granular, dry fertilizer, compost, water-soluble fertilizer. You don't have to overdo it, but you want it to be in there. All right, four minutes to go. Joni, very appreciated. So Kathy, my son's garden is doing well. He uh, is learning to become a chef. So he's excited because sometimes he's bringing the herbs that we started there over to the restaurant. He uses them there. Um, he said just yesterday, um, you know, I'm not going to grow as much dill. It's overtaking and it's shadowing the basil, which is good because I was like, that's a good problem. You're growing in a way that the dill plant is getting to full size and you don't have to do a bunch of little dill that doesn't get to size. You're now able to do one or two plants. You know where to put them, so it's going well. Thanks for asking.
Um, thank you, Angela. How do we store finished compost? Finished compost can just sit out there, you know, but if it's completely done and you don't want it and, you, you know, there is, you know, if it's raining and hitting it all the time, yeah, some stuff will leach out. But you can just let it sit in a pile somewhere. If you want to put a cover over it, I do a tarp. That keeps the moisture in. It keeps the rain from soaking through it. And it makes great compost. So just a, I would just put a small tarp maybe right over the top. You know, let the perimeter get wet. But it's a good way to, you know, keep your compost. It doesn't have to stay bone dry. If that's for a big amount, if you have smaller amounts, um, you can put it in a five gallon bucket and put a lid on it and stuff like that. So Susan, I can't answer that question in two minutes, but Brussels sprouts are the brassica family. They can take a good 80 to 100 days to mature. Um, you want to be growing them when it's cooler, like you can't grow them here in Maryland, May, June, and July. You actually can, but sometimes they don't form well, they don't taste as good. So you want a good 80 days from a transplant going into the ground or 100 from when a seed germinates because they just take a long time. To control the bugs, you have to spray regularly, like using neem oil every two weeks to just keep the bug population down. Dill can be planted now. Now is a good time. Dill doesn't like to be in the baking heat, so you can plant dill seeds now, get it growing. They can actually take a little bit of a frost and they'll be great. I don't have a video on clay soil, but that'd be a great time to um, maybe do a no dig garden. And I am working on a video, but I'm doing it in parts and it's not gonna be done till all the parts are done, where I planted a tomato plant into my clay soil and you just fix planting hole. You fix it up nicely, put the plant in, and you just let it grow into the clay. That will be later down the lines. Oh, good. You know, for that project, Joni, on converting your space into permaculture food. I really think, like, if we, you know, get out of the mindset and look at taking back a percentage, not all of it, but a percentage of your yard and dedicating it to growing food, it's a lot of fun. Like I am getting so many peaches off my trees now that I'm asking people to come and pick them or when people are walking by, grab some peaches. It took a while to get them established, learning about fruit trees, but eventually I will have so much food, you know, you can share it. And down the line, I would love communities to join together and use the empty spaces on their properties and work together as friends and just have fun growing food and sharing it with everybody. My, I don't think he probably did anything wrong, Michael. Like dill can have issue with being too wet, doesn't like the heat. If you know your trying to grow it and it's getting really hot or extreme that's usually a problem i would try and plant dill right now from seed and see what it does because as i was saying maybe this is a good way to wrap things up because it's 12 o'clock is there's no exact time to plant everything as a seed or a transplant cold warm crops or cool crops, warm crops, spring, summer, fall. You just have to kind of do it in your garden, take notes, and then that's what will give you information for next year when to plant. All right, we have to end there. It's 12 o'clock. Again, if you like this format, please check out my perk memberships, and I will be doing uh, Garden Grounds, this Q&A, every second and fourth Thursday of the month at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. Thanks so much for watching.